Okay. So do you want to wait another minute or two or, or shall we go ahead and I just want to honor Representative Autry's time. Yeah, I have a 12 o'clock. Yeah. And uh, we can let people in as they come. I can, I, uh, I'll make every effort to let folks in that come a little late, Laurie. Okay. Well, I hope you can, so you can see the slides too as we go through them or not? <laughs> Hopefully. Oh, yes, I can see them. Yes. Okay, good, good. Because something you said earlier made me wonder. All right. Well, then let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody for coming today. Uh, it is so exciting to see my brothers and sisters whose lived experience informs their passion for seeing change in North Carolina. Um, as some of y'all know, uh, 20 years ago when I was advocating, there was nobody else. And so I was a pretty easily dismissed voice. <laughs> but now, you know, we have upward of 100 people um, signing up for these and, and getting educated together. This is empowering and it's exciting for this old gal. So I'm just delighted to see everybody here. Um, so we're gonna talk, in, talk with um, a representative who's very much engaged in some of these solutions today, uh, in some of the concerns today. And um, we'll move to the first slide to get us started. Uh, to let people in, I have to move away from the slide. All right. So that's what's going on, just so you know, Laura. Okay, that's fine. So the second slide that we'll move to <clears throat> will be familiar to people who have come um, to, the, uh, to the last presentation because I talk about our state seal and the comment on that seal, the, the words on that seal are Latin saying to be rather than to seem. And this is our opportunity to help North Carolina become a state that really is instead of just talks about being um, a, a state that cares about the welfare of all of its sitting, citizens, including those of us with mental health challenges or uh, substance use or other disability type things. So um, next slide, and y'all bear with us. We're having to let people in while also managing the slides. So, and I've got something to close here, all right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce Representative John Autry, who we consider to be a legislative cha champion at this point on uh, trying to improve how people in crisis are responded to. And we're going to, um, uh, we're gonna interview him, find out some things, and we're gonna learn about three bills that he introduced in the, in the short and the long session which did not get fully heard as a lot of bills didn't because of all the things coming at the legislature, COVID funds coming from the federal government and all that and uh, redistricting. Um, but the opportunity we have in the short session is perhaps kind of getting these bills moved forward for discussion and a vote. And so that's what we're all working together with Representative Autry and his co-sponsors to, to try to get to happen. We're gonna talk about some of the key concepts in these bills so y'all can kind of get your heads around them. We're gonna try and make them a little, demystify it a little bit so you can understand it. And we're gonna list some action steps for trying to promote change. Next slide. And I will warn you, there's a lot of language on my slides, but we won't be reading most of it. Um, it's, it's, we understand that a lot of people want the slides after the presentations are over. And so I tried, these are, this is an educational process. So there's some language in here, um, but we're not gonna like sit and read through all the slides. So, so y'all can read along um, as we kind of go through the contents. So um, Representative Autry um, has been in the house representing uh, Mecklenburg County or parts of it um, since 2017. And he is a fella that besides the hard work he does in his local community and the hard work he does at the state, he's also the fella that looks forward to leaving Raleigh and leaving those those big buildings and going and getting down on the floor with his grand grandsons and playing with them. He is rooted in humanity and all the stages of development and he's very caring and concerned about how life in this world impacts everybody differently. He wants to know there are supports in place 
for people in his family and people in all of our families. And so um, just, I will say he, he did get recognized by Mental Health America at their recent um, uh, annual event for his legislative leadership because of his efforts with these bills. Next slide, please. So we're gonna have a little conversation to help you get, guys get a little better acquainted with him. And um, because I think for me, that when I first started advocating with legislators, they didn't seem real human. <laughs> and we want to bring, this is a gentleman who wants to interact and, 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 under, and you to understand his humanity and what brings him to these issues. So, um, so Representative Autry, you know, who are you and what, what is it that makes you tick? Wow. Well, uh, first of all, I, I don't know if I should be characterized as a uh, behavioral health champion because champion to me connote, denotes some sort of success <laughs> in getting some legislation passed. Uh, but I continue to lean into this and, and, and am ever hopeful that we can see some results from these efforts here in the short session. And looking at also what could come out of the Joint Oversight Committee on Health and Human Services. Um, well, good morning, everyone. I am John Autry. I currently serve you in the North Carolina House of Representatives from District 100 here in Mecklenburg County. Uh, I like to say that I represent everybody in North Carolina. It's just the folks who reside in District 100 who get to vote for me. But uh, I will be, I'm currently serving in my third term, and I will have a fourth term as I am running unopposed this year. And I think that's a gift and a uh, curse all at the same time in some, some aspects. But uh, serving in the General Assembly has been uh, the most rewarding, the most frustrating, the most aggravating, the most humbling, the most gratifying experience of my life, uh, except for maybe becoming a grandparent. Okay, let me just put that in there, because I think being a grandparent is the one thing in life that isn't overrated. And uh, I appreciate Laurie uh, recalling of uh, how I am able to cope myself with some of these frustrations in serving the General Assembly is that when I am in Raleigh, I, I am fortunate to that our, uh, our youngest child, our son, and his family reside in Wake County, so I get to stay with him and he has a, a nine-year-old boy and a five-year-old boy, and uh, they fill me with all of the inspiration and motivation that I need to keep going back and pounding my head against the cinder block walls in the legislative building. Um, and I, I originally got into politics because I wanted to have a positive impact on my community but then our children blessed us with grandchildren. <laughs> and so my motivation has shifted some now to my concern about what sort of world that I will be leaving behind for them. Because whatever action or influence I may have on policy today isn't really going to benefit me. It's probably not going to benefit you directly, but it will certainly have benefits for our grandchildren. Uh, I say the grandchildren instead of our children because I think we kind of screwed it up for our children because uh, my children are working harder for less. And uh, that is something that I'm working to try to, you know, correct the ship a little bit. Uh, I previously, before going to the legislature, I was elected to three terms on the Charlotte City Council. And I'm sure everyone remembers HB2, you yeah. can blame HB2 on me because I was the city council member in Charlotte who brought forth the initiative to amend the city's non-discrimination ordinance to include LGBTQ people. Um, but mental health, behavioral health for me was always something that I tried to support from the outside. Uh, last year, I'm sorry, two years ago now, 
uh, a young man who worked as an intern in the office next to my office in the legislature, a young man by the name of Gerard James, who is just an incredible human being. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came to me with some concepts around how to uh, better uh, respond to 911 calls that didn't involve violence or a weapon. And so we started this journey in July of 20, gosh, was it 2021, 2019? No, 20, 2020, it was when we got started in July of, of that year. And we went all over the country virtually with uh, talking to academia as far away as uh, 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 the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we talked to uh, the operators of the STAR program, which is a non-police 911 response to, that is uh, propped up in Denver that has been operating now for about a year and a half. We also talked to the operators of the CAHOOTS program, which is in Eugene, Oregon, which is another program that does not, uh, that sends mental health experts, uh, people with lived experience, clinicians, or to uh, respond to 911 calls that don't involve violence or a weapon there also. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in learning about this, it, it seemed like there was a lot of opportunity to help direct some of the thinking that bureaucrats and politicians have about how to address behavioral health needs in North Carolina specifically. So Gerard just was just relentless and did not give an inch for any compromise with our objectives. And so he produced this incredible document that laid out the strategies, the, the shortfalls of the current system, where it could be shored up, where it should be changed, why it should be modified. And we shared that with all the legislature and crickets. <laughs> I mean, except for, you know, Representative Insco and Representative Cunningham, they wanted to hear more about these things. So as the long session started last year, uh, uh, I worked with Gerard and we produced a memo that we could take to bill drafting to get some legislation. And that resulted in House Bill 786, House Bill 787, and House Bill uh, 788. Those three bills... I then, once we had those drafted up, uh, I then took them to uh, Representative uh, Donnie Lambeth, who's from uh, uh, I... Forsyth County. He's a retired hospital administrator. And uh, when I first approached him with the concept of maybe pushing something together for this session, his first words out of his mouth was, well, the mental health system in North Carolina is broken. And my response to that was, well, I know who can fix that. <laughs> and so when I had the legislation ready, and it was about uh, a week before the deadline to file bills for the long session, I took them to him at the beginning of the session. I, I made sure to stand by the door that he comes in so I could buttonhole him and hand off the bills to him. And so then we started the session and he had the bills and great, I'm sure I'll hear from him. But before uh, we had the second vote, I could pick up somebody moving towards me in my peripheral vision to my left, and it was him with the bills. And he said, those are good bills. You know, we should get some traction with these. And I said, well, wonderful. Would you consider being a co-sponsor as one of the primary sponsors with me? He says, absolutely. And then he started giving me some advice of who else I should probably talk to. Now, Representative Lambeth is a senior appropriations chair. The appropriations committee is the house committee that has their hands on the purse strings of the state treasury. He is also a senior chair of the house health committee. But we didn't get any traction with leadership on these bills. Uh, the leadership in the house and the senate are in constant communication with each other about well, so-and-so introduced this, or you, would you be taking that up? And if 
there's if one chamber has something they want to move on and the other chamber signals that they're not interested in taking up, there's a very good chance that that bill will just die in the committee. So uh, apparently the Senate, the leadership in the, in the North Carolina Senate does not see behavioral health issues as a priority in North Carolina. And it's not like we don't have the expertise at the Department of Health and Human Services to implement these programs. And it certainly isn't like we don't have the money because the last report I got from the state controller showed over $9 billion in the state treasury wow. that are unappropriated. Now, I, I always try to offer a little perspective about money, okay? So uh, if you convert dollars to seconds, a million seconds is 11 days. A billion seconds is 31 years. Wow. We have the money. We know what to do. We just aren't doing it. And so my objective and, and what keeps me ticking is keep leaning into this because I want to see some action on this. And, and this is something that I had, I mean, just, you know, superficial surface level understanding of until Gerard James came to me in July of 2020 and we started down this journey together. So I appreciate you all being here this morning and I'm sorry I took so much time rambling on, but I felt like there was, this was a great opportunity to share some of the mechanisms that are underway within the legislature and to uh, share what my experiences and what has brought me to this. So thank you. That's really helpful. And I think it'll be really important for the folks who are hearing it from you kind of what that game is like. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention, I did send an invitation to Gerard. The irony is this amazing young man is also a football coach right now. He's up at uh, is Michigan, it Michigan State. State. Yeah. And they've had a great season, but he still calls and checks in to find out what's going on with this. So, um, and there are a couple of other folks, I don't know if they're on or not, but um, Gerard pulled together a working group <clears throat> <clears throat> to help give information to uh, let them think through to uh, create the, the bill language. And um, he reached out to um, one of the um, public defenders in Mecklenburg County, Bob Ward. And if he's on here, welcome, Bob. Bob is, he's not gone away. None of us have gone away on these issues. B.B. Smith, who is a uh, social worker by background and has a lot of influence in that realm. She's also one that wants to see changes, so she may be on too. But um, the cool thing too is that two of us were people, two of us in this working group were people with our own personal lived experience that drives a lot of what we do. And so Shereen Carrico and I were on this work group that helped to inform Gerard's efforts with uh, Representative Autry. And um, so that brings me to, to wanting to ask, because you kind of answered some of the other questions that I had asked, but. Um, what role, since so many of us are peer supporters, or at least we value our experience, um, even if we're not peer supporters, um, it, we know we have things to contribute in our communities. So can I ask, um, what kind of um, role do you think having a peer operated setting that's really pretty well entrenched in, across some of the uh, public effort, public service efforts in uh, Mecklenburg County. Has that played a role in your thinking about, about some of this or, or was that seen as a go-to or? Uh, it, it seemed like peer support in, in these efforts in addressing behavioral health seems to me as uh, a very logical point to uh, keep driving for. And that is because it, who better to have empathy, understanding, uh, respect, to be able to uh, display dignity to someone who is in crisis than someone who has been down that path themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, if, and, and in making these decisions and, and, and trying to shape policy, 
folks who have lived experience are the best voices that we can have at the table. You know, I, I've had multiple conversations with Laurie and Shireen, and sometimes Shireen and Gerard and I would convene a meeting at 9.30 on Tuesday evening. But those were important discussions and important conversations because Gerard and I would be driving down, you know, a pathway and we'd say, well, should it be going to A or going to B or what, you know, and then we could reach out to Shireen and she would say, well, let's get on a call and talk to so-and-so. It, it, it was that sort of dedication and uh, being so serious about their work and their appreciation for the uh, crisis that a lot of people are confronted with because having that experience themselves, I mean, that's a great resource to uh, lean on in trying to shape policy. So I am just forever thankful for uh, the opportunity that has been presented to me to learn about this because I just need something else to worry about. <laughs> you know? But uh, it, it, it has been very rewarding and, and I'm so appreciative of all the support that I have felt around these efforts and these ideas. And um, so with uh, Representative Insco retiring at the end of this term, uh, there's an opportunity for someone else to come along and take up that mantle. And it may not be me. Someone else in our caucus could be inspired by this work that we've been doing the last couple of years, who's better prepared, better educated to uh, take the mantle and, and the torch along with them and lead this effort. But what we have to do as advocates is to continue to lean into it. And I would say that the best way that you can do that is to get engaged with your local representative. I don't care if you're in Surrey County. I don't care if you're in Pender County. I don't care if you're in Pamlico County. I don't care if you're in Wayne County. You have representation that is available to you that you can lean on on these efforts. And so when it comes time to advocate for these, for these policy shifts and these policy changes and the funding that is necessary for that, you need to start establishing relationships with your local representative on the ground where you live. Here, here. Yeah. And it, it's, yes, you've got three bills that you can point to, but without that engagement, that doesn't mean anything. We have policy initiatives that can make a huge difference in people's lives. Think about uh, the, the, when I was listening to Corey Hess in, in the meeting, he said, in our two hospitals and our EDs, we have 25 beds. At any given time, 10 to 15 of those beds are occupied by patients with behavioral health crises that don't have a place they can be put to start receiving treatment. So imagine if you're in Harnett County and your you know, five-year-old grandson breaks his arm and you have to take him to the hospital, is there going to be a place there available for him? Imagine if you have a heart attack and you have to go to that emergency department. Is there going to be a room there for you? I mean, it's, it, it's awful and it's frustrating, but it, it's, it's the real world. And, if, and, and just because it hasn't happened to you doesn't mean it shouldn't matter to you. Exactly. So I, I obviously I, I've become so involved with this that my passion sometimes gets the better of me and I can ramble on and ramble on about it. But if you have another specific question, now would be a great time to ask it. <laughs> well, and before we do that, I wanna add another uh, a historic politician leader that we all are familiar with is Thomas Jefferson, who said one time, who then can so softly bind the wound of another as he who has felt the same wound himself. 
And um, so it, it's just, I think what's remarkable and exciting for us as peers is to find somebody who gets that <laughs> principle that the people who relate most directly are the people who probably have some of the best understanding of what could be the solutions. And um, so I just thank you for reaching out and being so inclusive of so many. I see that B.B. Smith had, had made a note. She wants to see this advocacy effort grow and she wants to uh, participate and, and see, see us keep pushing uh, for these bills. What I was thinking, I was going to start reviewing the bills right quickly with you, but that's pretty dry. Um, I think it might be more important if we have some time and if, if Karen is up to it, <laughs> Karen, if you are up to it, to, to, to let a few people ask some questions of Representative Autry. Do you think we'd be up for that? Sure, I think we can uh, review the chat or we can just, uh, if you raise your hand, does everyone know how to raise their hand? You go to the reactions uh in the the menu below and it's one two three four five six over and you hit reactions there and then you scroll down to raise hand so why don't you uh if you have a question why don't you go ahead and raise your hand or put something in the chat and we'll try to uh, be sure that you get your question asked i don't see any hands raised right now I did see a question from somebody, and I know that we don't have the time to totally answer this right now, but just a heads up, there's somebody who has run against Tim Moore before that, uh, let's see if I can find this. Oh, that's Jennifer Childers. You saw that, thank yeah. You, Jennifer, thank you for being with us today. I appreciate that. Yes, uh, Ms. Childers ran uh, against Tim Moore in 2020, and um She's, her question is, uh, any ideas of how to establish a relationship, seeing as how I challenged him in the election? That's probably one of the better inroads you have, because if you call him and ask to set up a chance to, or, or a chance to speak with him, he knows exactly who you are. <laughs> uh, it's not like he starts to has to go into, well, let me check a LinkedIn profile to see who this person is or something, you know? Uh, it's a great way to go ahead because you've already got that <laughs> hostile relationship going. Now it's time to form that bridge to help uh, us in our efforts in, in moving these around. Because I think it, it, it it's, it's not who I know. It's who you know, Miss Childers. And uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, and that has to be, uh, uh, things that you have to be able to navigate because of what your experience are with those individuals. And I would say that having challenged him in election is a great way to open up a channel of communication and say, well, I know I ran against you. And let me tell with you some of the reasons as to why I ran against you. Cool. You understand that's your end. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Craig. Appreciate that comment. Hi, Lori, I have a question. Sure. This, sure. this is Shireen. Hey, Shireen. Hello, Representative Baji, how are you? Great, great, miss you. I miss you too, it's so good to see you. Thank you for joining us. So you have taught me so many lessons learned in the process. I, I think when you and I met, I said, I, I was afraid of legislators, I was afraid of politicians. I had never, you know, I'd been a person with lived experience and been involved in, in many movements, but never really at the level where you and I were able to work together. And then I met you and it was like, oh, he's just a regular person. You're not at all, <laughs> uh, you know, everything I was afraid of, you really debunked in my first meeting when you showed up with red glasses and I don't even know, a red shirt or something on. And you also, so in, in part, you gave me, um, the confidence to actually meet with other people and not think of them as, um, I, I don't know, whatever impression I had. The second thing that, that you taught me, though, was about concession, right? No, from a strategy perspective, you go in with your intentions on what you want this to look like and be ready that there's going to have to be negotiations around it. And there are a lot of concessions in these bills, that we ended up making that we pushed back on. I pushed back on, Gerard at times pushed back on, you pushed back on, but ultimately 
there was a lot of lessons learned in the best laid plans versus what would actually be listened to, what could be supported. Can you share a little bit about that process and why it's important as advocates to come in and recognize that your vision may end up having to be modified in different ways? Yeah, and, and I, am, I am terrible at compromise especially when there is so much good that be, can be generated mm -hmm. from the way these, this whole process started. But I understand also that I serve in the minority. And when I was on the Charlotte City Council, every day I walked into the government center, I was in the majority. It's a different story in the minority. And so you have to have someone from the other side in the, other, in the majority's caucus that you can work with and communicate with and come to some resolution as to, okay, is this language acceptable to both of us? Well, acceptable is a stronger word. I would say that I can live with it, you know? And we have to do, I mean, look at what was done with the budget this year. Now, I didn't vote for the budget because I still felt there was a lot of really tricky stuff in there, but it was only because we were able to stand firm as the minority and not support it because they were able to pass the bill, but then the governor properly vetoed it, which forced them into conference and which meant that they had to have enough democratic support to pass a bill that would be acceptable to them. So we, we're always uh, negotiating one aspect or another. Now, one, one of the more frustrating things that you can experience is, and, and I had this in the long session last year uh, regarding some energy policy, is to uh, be involved in a discussion with a, par uh, a member of the majority party. And that discussion can go on weeks that discussion can go on for months to help shape legislation. But now you're getting down to the wire when the bill has to be filed and that person comes to you and says, well, I think it's acceptable now, but I can't put my name on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you, you, know, you know, it's like that line in Forrest Gump, you know, life is like a box of chocolate. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. But uh, I have to, I, I'm just, there's just something that won't let me let go <laughs> that, that I just want to, to, to keep pushing and to keep some sort of discussion and, and, and observation is very good too, because then it's after there's a, uh, 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 you're frustrated with like that. Well, who is that person working with next? What is, what is that agenda that they are, so uh, uh, engaged with and committed to that prohibits them from helping me with something that's going to be good for a lot of people that reside in their own district. It just seems counterproductive, but that's where we are with the, with the, the and I, I see Miss uh, Karen, I see your uh, uh, comments there in the chat and you're, you're right. It, it, it doesn't pay to cooperate, but if we're not cooperating, we're just filing bills and making statements. We're not helping to shape policy. And, and Shireen, uh, something that's so important about doing this and continuing to lean into it is because if you can listen to the, uh, I think it was March 28th meeting of the legislative joint overs, they were talking about all the things that we were talking about two years ago. Mm -hmm about how there aren't enough beds for treatment, how that they, uh, the, the IVC process t tends to do more damage than it does good. Yeah. And so it's, it's, yes, we didn't pass legislation last year, but we planted a lot of seeds. That's right. And got a lot of people thinking about it. So and I think- I just want to add, uh, this is what leadership is about, is making that choice to stay on the bleeding edge. Um, and, and I know we who are trying to operate peer organizations that have no promise of funding, um, it's so much work. 
and you don't know if all that work is going to turn into anything or not. But that is the risk that high character takes. <laughs> and I, I just want to applaud you because I know at times you sounded like, oh my gosh, and you know, maybe I should take my name off the bill, then it may be able to pass because it'll all be Republican. But no, um, I just, it, it, we do have to make compromises. It's deciding where are the compromises going to shift us from the values that originally are driving what we're trying to do. But um, I just, I applaud you for hanging in there. And you are so right. All these things that you saw two years ago and, and tried to get out there, all of a sudden there is a whole lot more interest. And if we as peer supporters and peers, people with our lived experience get involved and help advocate, we're a new body of advocates that have been pretty much voiceless till now. And, um, you know, I've heard legislators basically uh, suggest that they're used to those who come to them in advocating being those who receive money from them, provider agencies, the professional advocacy organizations, et cetera. So they're not even realizing that the people out here, the intended beneficiaries, that, that we have a voice and we can really unite and get behind these kinds of opportunities and turn them from uh, rhetoric into actual change. And so I appreciate so much your effort. So let, let me just say this about advocacy. And I, I see Ms. Childers has, you know, how, you know, she's asked again, where and how. You can come to the building, That's a, but one of the best ways is to find out when that representative is, is going to be in a public setting okay. and, I think. and then come in with the correct uh, information that you can ask a question if there's an opportunity to ask a question. If there's not an opportunity for the public to ask questions during that event, stick around until the person starts working the room and then you can buttonhole them and, and, and present them with what you're interested in and how you're concerned about it. And I mean, but practice that 30 second elevator speech <laughs> because you may only have 30 seconds. And then it's, well, I'd like to call your office and like to follow up with you about this and continue this discussion. Yeah, sure, call the office. Well, you may never hear from them again, but then again, you may, you may, especially as the swell and the, the pot around these issues of behavioral health and the lack of, uh, of real uh, 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 state support in that arena continue to bubble up. Uh, but if, if you want to advocate, I, I'll, I used to say, you can't get hit by the train unless you lie down on the track. So you got to get on the track where the train is running and that's going to be different for every district, for every representative. And, you know, there's no one blanket solution or, or answer to that. Thank you for that. Any other questions? I realize you've got another meeting. It's 1143. So I don't know. Yeah, if you're can I just say some, can I just provide some intel on what, where the current discussions are? Sure. That was the, the, that was, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, House Bill 786 and 788 have appropriations in them, and they are currently sitting in the health committee. So they are not dead bills because they have appropriations. So bills with appropriations can still be heard during the short session. So there is still hope for them. And I'm, I'm informed by uh, my co-sponsor that uh, his discussions with staff during the joint legislative oversight committees, because we had some discussion about, can we weave these bills into the report that will be coming out of that oversight committee? Because what comes out of that is going to have a lot more opportunity to become official policy in North Carolina than just John Autry filing some more bills. So 786 and 788 uh, have appropriations so that I am told that during the short session, we'll bring those up in the health committee and then appropriations and then move them through to the floor. There's going to have to be a PC, a PCS is a proposed committee substitute. And so uh, some of the dates that are reflected in those bills will have to be adjusted before they could be heard and be pertinent for, you know, being approved in the short session and being implemented next year. 787, which was about 
getting data on involuntary commitments. And I was so happy to hear S Senator uh, Bergen uh, ask the question during the committee meeting, you know, uh, asking, well, can we get some, do you folks asking DHHS, do you have data on how many IVCs go through EDs and hospitals? And so we want to know how many go through the EDs and hospitals, but we want to know all of the IVCs, where they come from, how they're originated, where the patients ended up and what is happening to those patients. Because currently right now in North Carolina, we don't know. And I don't believe, I, I'm a, I'm a data-driven individual. I like to know if, if we're going to start adjusting policy, do we have the data that can justify the change in policy or establishing new policy. And without us collecting that information, that's gonna be impossible, I think. So uh, it, was, it was, you know, my colleagues you know, intent to have 787, the IVC gathering of that data and preparing it in reports to go to the Legislative Oversight Committee was be baked into the report that will be coming out of that. So fingers crossed, and we'll keep leaning into it, but that's, that's kind of where it is. Looks like we have a question here. Yeah. Earl Owens uh, has a question. And Earl, did you want to unmute yourself, or did you? Uh, I'll help you unmute there. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question, Earl? Um, yeah, so I, I guess I got a couple of, um, a couple of pathways to this one. You know, I really appreciate, you know, the um, the effort that's being put forth, you know, in, um, in pushing, you know, peer support, you know, to, um, to the level that it's at now. And hopefully, you know, we'll be able to even make some more progress. But, um, and I'm here in Mecklenburg County. Um, so I have, a, I have been able to develop a relationship with um, Atrium Behavioral Health. So, um, and they have a peer support on staff there. So what their peer support does is tries to connect anyone that comes through the ED to um, explore the idea of peer support services in an effort to give them an alternative to hospitalization. Um, and so far that has, that, has, um, that has been working in moderation um, and to the gentlemen that was just speaking about data, um, I got plenty of it, you know, in terms of um, making the connection, you know, um, um, introducing, you know, a potential um, client to peer support services and what that looks like as an alternative to um, hospitalization. And so um, my question is, is that um, in the next um, session, for um, Mecklenburg County, um, how can we as um, boots on the ground peer support specialists um, get involved and, and have our voices heard, you know, to the, um, to the committee members regarding um, what's really needed for peer supports and the service that we provide for persons that, you know, um, are experiencing you know, behavioral health um, challenges. Yes, thank you for that question, uh, uh, Mr. Owens. I, I, and you're, you're, you're spot on here again with, uh, you know, using data to help influence these decisions. But, you know, you have some members of the majority party current in, in the legislature who uh, think the best thing to do with folks with behavioral health issues is just to lock them up and keep them out of sight. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, and I'm still learning some of this from these folks <laughs> and uh, just take them off my list of folks that I need to be talking to next because Carl Sagan, you know, the great astrophysicist said, you can't convince a believer of anything because their belief isn't rooted in data or uh, uh, observation or experience. It's rooted in an overwhelming power and of a need to just believe. So, uh, 
here in Mecklenburg County, I can assure you that the Mecklenburg delegation in the legislature is committed and, and interested in these efforts for peer support. Uh, some of the most interesting things about uh, the oversight committee meeting in March was how you had folks from DHHS, uh, Dave Richards, uh, and, and the secretary all talking about how much more expensive it was to address these behavioral health e issues in, in the mechanisms in the past that are currently operational within North Carolina versus using peer support. They kept using the term uh, community, uh, community support and treatment, but what they were really about was peer support because peer support is gonna give us the insights that are necessary of being able to reach these folks who are in crisis. I don't have those skills. I don't have those abilities, but you folks do. And so I would say that how you can help these committees move these pieces forward. First of all, you need to track the committees and find out when they're taking action and what they're discussing in their agendas. Listen into those meetings, pay attention to who had the most compelling arguments for moving or changing policy, reaching out to them, letting them know what your experience are. Listen, nothing can move somebody like a personal story. Mm -hmm. nothing. And when that personal story comes from the person who experienced it, even better. So I hope that's helpful to you. But, you know, I'm in Mecklenburg. So and I've provided my contact information in the chat function. So you're welcome to zip back through there and uh, uh, pull that out and contact me directly. And we'll try to collaborate and work on this together. Okay. And I, if I, well, can I, let me add something just right quick. Um, the rest of the, after Representative Autry leaves, we, we will go through some of the steps we can all be taking to advocate and um, that'll help kind of get in people's minds some strategies. But um, I also want to mention that part of why Peer Voice is, is hosting this series that we've been hosting is to help us uh, learn what, what steps can we take to get our information to the right folks? And you know, what's some of the messaging that we think will impact the way they're thinking about things because there's a lot of old thinking out there. So um, what you asked was specifically kind of addressing what Peer Voice Advocacy Coalition is all about. And so we're um, just glad to be able to have this opportunity to learn so much right now. And yes, there are steps and we'll go over those in future slides once um, Representative Autry has to sign off. Okay, next question you said, Karen? Yes, I think Nikel has a question. Did you un unmute yourself? I'll uh, try to unmute you here. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, Representative Autry, my question is, in listening to you discuss um, the playing field of politics, how do you personally stay encouraged when you see um, matters such as this not being taken seriously? How do you, you know, keep coming back, understanding that uh, politics is somewhat of a game um, and that there are humans at the expense of the game? How, how do you stay encouraged to keep fighting? when you are in the party? I, I would have to say that uh, you just pretty much answered my, your question yourself by saying, you know, how can you stand by and continue to see these uh, misserved humans, fellow citizens and residents of North Carolina who continue to suffer under the bearings of a system that is broken? I mean, it... I don't know any other reason that you could need for someone who was a empathetic human being to not want to continue to remain engaged and continue to press for these issues. As, as, and, and as I said earlier, you know, um, my youngest grandchild will be uh, six years old next month. And at the age of six, we have no idea what sort of challenges that he's going to present when he's 15 or 16 or 17. 
And I think about what it might be like to have him to have to be handcuffed and put in the back of a police car and taken to an emergency department and stay in that emergency department for 94 days before there is a bed available to provide him the treatment. That whole process is going to be more disruptive, more damaging to him than anything I could, I could bear to conceive. So uh, I, I just have to keep leaning in into it that way. And I see that Bob Ward has joined us and hey, Bob, good to see you. Oh. Uh, but I really do need to jump off now. I, I would love to spend more time the whole session with you, but I have a previous obligation that I have to get on at 12 o'clock. And uh, as you can see how much coffee I've had, I'm going to need a little break before I get into that meeting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think everybody has enjoyed this so much because you've rehumanized what you guys are all about. <laughs> they, they go to Raleigh and <laughs> sit in those meetings all day, but uh, you, you have helped make all this more approachable to us. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, especially for your leadership right now in this moment. Thank you very much. And thank you all for what you do every single day. I mean, I have to deal with it one day or two days a week, but what you're confronting with every day and what you're having to overcome, I, I just couldn't imagine what you had to do through. So uh, you and your work and what you do and how you do it is also keeping me motivated and inspired to keep moving forward. So thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your meeting. And I hope to join you again very soon with a great success story. All right. <laughs> so thank We're going to be working with you. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. I like that last question, Ms. Rudisville. So you want to go to the next slide, Ms. Karen? So... But uh, before we proceed, I do want to re remind you again, this is a presentation of the Peer Advocacy Coalition of Peer Voice North Carolina. Peer Voice North Carolina is a SAMHSA funded, um, let's see, I don't, I don't want to say attempt because we've gone beyond attempt, but um, we are tasked with helping to develop a mental health recovery movement in North Carolina among people who with lived experience. And so, What's been cool about Peer Voice is the first uh, couple of years of it was mostly around letting, letting local leaders all across the state create coalitions that um, people have been able to meet through Zoom from all over the state around certain topics. And so we have these little coalitions and that's been wonderful. Now we're at this place where Peer Voice is having to kind of look at, okay, how do we offer some more substantial leadership so we have guidance that can help support and, and, and help direct best results from all of our efforts. So we're kind of at this stage where there's just a whole lot of thinking and responding going on. And um, hopefully you'll hear more and we'll have an active website coming out to help you have a better understanding of what, what this is all about. But um, I uh, also wanted to offer a, a thanks to NAMI I, I believe it's NAMI North Carolina or maybe it's the NAMI Northwest Piedmont, Piedmont. Karen, you can correct me, but they are the ones who went ahead and purchased more minutes for this Zoom meeting because we had a lot more it's people. NAMI, it's NAMI High Country out of Boone. It's the affiliate. Thank you. Out of Boone Thank you. That's right. I'm sorry. NAMI we High Country. So it's way in Northwest. <laughs> we purchased extra so that we could have over 100 people on the call and that's good for a month. So thank you for thanking us here in NAMI. Yeah. So thanks for that. So, um, yeah, now is our time. Uh, we have been unheard in North Carolina through all these years, but we're the most knowledgeable people about what is working and what is not and what we really need. Um, and we, and I want to, you'll see me affirm this one of the place in these slides, we are entitled to expect accountability. Our public um, our government is supposed to be purchasing things that work, that help our lives, our health get better. And um, so never have, have our voices been as important as they are now. Next slide. 
So now we're gonna talk about the contents of the bill. Basically, this is kind of a brief regurgitation of what's in each bill. So you can kind of wrap your heads around that. Next, next slide. So, oh, before we start that, just some background on this. Um, Y'all may be aware that Peer Voice North Carolina, one of their coalitions called Recovery Alternatives to Forced Treatment, we regard we consider it the RAFT coalition. It had mostly peers, had a few people like Bob Ward that I've mentioned, who is on, uh, on the uh, meeting now, and B.B. Smith, who's also on the meeting, who are wanting to support um, better alternatives to uh, responding to people in crisis. Um, that coalition gathered data with the support of Bob um, to look at the numbers of involuntary commitments happening across the state, county by county. And then um, on the right, if you can see, um, Peer Voice put out this little uh, bulletin that, that looked at um, the data for this period between 2009 and 2018, how many incidences of involuntary uh, hospitalization of children and adults, so this isn't just the number of people going to the EDs, this is the number of people involuntarily hospitalized. And what's important to understand about this is that when people are IVC'd, basically that's an order that lets uh, uh, law enforcement people pick, pick, pick someone up and take them to the ED for an evaluation. So a lot of those people who are forcibly taken in a fairly traumatic way to the ED, they may be found not to need to be admitted. So um, we're not talking only about forced inpatient care. We're talking about the, the times that forces had, people are compelled by law to have to be taken to the ED and then maybe even forced into treatment. So um, the estimated cost of this for the people who are actually going into hospitals, they looked at the numbers of, of bed days and price per day, bed day. That's 230 million. <laughs> $677,198. So the point is, if we're wanting accountability, we wanna be sure that all these dollars are not buying forced something, but that dollars are shifted to really paying for things that help people toward recovery of mental health. So um, that little call to action was sent out a couple of years ago and uh, several articles got written about these issues. There's a link there in the, in the um, slide people can go to later and um, look at, they've actually archived several articles about this through the North Carolina Health News that, that wrote these articles. Well, those articles started hitting the legislature. And so that helped raise alarm bells while um, Representative Autry was also working at the community level and then pulling together the information with Gerard James. But um, so that's kind of the background that kicked all this new interest off. We really have a serious problem. My own county, Forsyth County, has more than doubled. Um, proportionally, it's, 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 I think, the second most um, proportionally. Anyway, I'm really concerned because my own son is no longer. Uh, we lost our son about three months after uh, an IVC type situation. And anyway, so the point is we have real problems and now is the time and we on this call know more than anybody what this is about. So next slide. So House Bill 786 is the one that would actually fund uh, communities through their police departments or sheriff's departments to kind of rethink <clears throat> and redesign how they respond to mental health challenges. The option that I think a lot of us favor is the not totally non-police option. Um, and um, well, I, I tell you what, let me refocus here. So let me just looking at the bill language, it's called Enhanced Local Response Mental Health Crisis. And it's a bill that's entitled an act to create a pilot program. Um, sorry, the, this is covered up. They will provide grants to local law enforcement agencies in order to enhance responses to mental health or behavioral health crises. And so um, the bill would establish an, and offer the funding to support these changes. And, and the kinds of changes would be um, co-responder models, which involve a law enforcement person and a mental health person, or um, even totally um, alternative response models that may have like a, uh, a paramedic 
with a mental health professional, including it could be a peer supporter. And as I said earlier in the meeting, I think, um, we, there are many communities who've moved to this, this kind of model that has a paramedic paired with a mental health professional. And in some of the urban areas, they are actually selecting peer supporters to be that mental health professional because they want people who can engage um, folks who are homeless, folks who have experienced pretty extreme things. Um, and, and so they find that really valuable. So this would give grants, not enough to cover a whole change, but to really help um, a, a city make a shift to a different type of approach. It also, if, for those who are using CIT, um, it might help strengthen how CIT is done. Although I will say the research is kind of showing CIT may be a little bit outmoded, but still it helps. It's a stepping stone for communities to think differently about just calling the police for someone in a mental health crisis. Second bill or second slide, House Bill 787. This is the data bill that Representative Autry was talking about um, that can't really go forward as a bill as it's written because it did not happen to have funding attached to it like the other two do. And that's just kind of how things are done in many states. During the short session, those, those bills that cross over have to be bills that have financial tags to them. So uh, like he was saying, that it's, it's really possible that the IVC, I mean, that the um, data bill could be kind of written into another existing bill. And um, so it's a bill called Improved Data on Involuntary Commitments and it's entitled An Act Establishing Involuntary Commitment Data Collection and Reporting Requirements for Area Facilities and Hospitals where first examinations for involuntary commitments are performed and for local management entities and managed care organizations. And then it, there's the summary there, which um, you can read. But um, there, there may be an opportunity to be sure that there's something amended or, or built into this bill language through our advocacy, um, where we want to be sure that this bill looks at data according to demographics that would be helpful for DHHS to understand how to, how to do things better. So uh, it might be ethnic demographics. It might be you know, racial, ethnic demography ages. We're gonna have a lot more baby boomers like me who are getting in their 60s and 70s who are having crisis needs that their needs may look different, need a little bit different kind of response. So without the demographic breakouts, we have really incomplete information. So we wanna be sure, we'll talk about that a little bit later, that, that kind of information gets written into a bill if this gets added in. Next slide. And I know I'm going quickly, but you guys will have these slides later to refer back to. This slide I, I think is especially important. It's called uh, Achieve Better Mental Health Recovery Results. A bill to be entitled An Act to Achieve Better Mental Health Recovery Results by supporting peer run recovery wellness centers by creating a North Carolina mental health recovery and resiliency agenda and by requiring a mental health recovery policy chief within the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities and Substance Use Services in the Department of Health and Human Services. So next slide. Um, let's see here. The, sorry, I'm trying to move my little pictures around. Um, so specifically, um, this involved development of objectives for mental health recovery outcomes and provide short-term and long-term objectives, tracking the implementation of efforts by DHHS to meet these objectives. Moving from a mainly medical model, which focuses mostly on being sure people are on their meds and being sure there's a whole lot of expensive crisis services to one that really supports people's lives getting better. Um, and next slide. This bill also um, calls for the establishment of a mental health recovery policy chief. This is important because I think a lot of folks have known that we've had strong representation and in, in leadership on the substance use recovery side of the division through the years. <clears throat> but as more and more understanding in the last 20 years about mental health recovery, 
about uh, you know, rehabilitation, peer support, uh, these things that help people really reclaim their lives, reduce crisis needs, uh, help people reintegrate into their communities, uh, get jobs, all those kinds of things. Um, we've not had any strong leadership to ensure at the Division of Mental Health that we were re that we're kind of shifting to a different paradigm from the old one of just uh, medical management. So this is a real important uh, thing. But having a, a lead person, um, he, that this person would also engage others with lived experience in mental health recovery and some other external experts to inform policy development. This is all written into the language. This person would have experience as a peer supporter, having experienced community realities and impacts. Next slide. And then the, the final step in this, although it's, it's written, I think this may be the first section of the actual language. I'm trying to put it where people, it can kind of seep better in people's minds. But um, admit this person, sorry. Um, so House Bill 78 calls for the establishment of four peer-run wellness centers, two in urban settings, two in rural settings, that can provide alternative responses to crises, provide peer support and crisis prevention. And the, the, so there are some funds built into the bill for this. We may we be advocating for a, a different level of funding from what we're learning right now from uh, operating the operation of some uh, peer operated settings as they are currently and what the costs we're realizing them to be. Um, the funds would be allocated to Promise Resource Network because it has 16 years of expertise in this in, in developing these organizations and making them effectively. And uh, it already it is a currently an incubator for two other peer run wellness centers. And um, we know that we really need these centers, especially the eastern part of the state seems like there, there have been people who wanted to try to uh, get a go, but because of how the, the population in the East is a little sparser, it's been really hard for them to get traction the way some of us in more urban settings have. We do have some things existing in the Western part already, but you know, we need a, we need, we need a backdrop of peer operated settings across the state. But anyway, um, Shireen is on this call and since she helped with um, some of the informing around the bills, she may have some comments she wants to add on the content of uh, especially 788. Hi, Lori, thank you. Um, so let me just take them one at a time and just give you a little bit of brief context so people feel, you know, maybe you have some um, insight information on why the bill landed the way that it did in terms of the, the language that was used. Um, so let's start with the bill around data. When Lori shared that visual that we had written up with Peer Voice North Carolina around the involuntary commitment data, it took us about three to four months to gather that data. The reason is the involuntary commitment data in North Carolina is not tracked and trended and reported on in a visible way for a lot of different reasons. So we had to contact every county's magistrate's office in the beginning to get this data. This is where Bob Ward, our public defender, came in. We had an intern working on this. Uh, I worked on it. And we had to get that data from every county and to, to get it uncoded in order to even get the information that we put out there. So the reason why the bill was created was so that this information is made public from an advocacy perspective. We don't even know where to begin advocating around involuntary commitments. Why are the rates so high? Why have they increased by nearly 100% in 10 years? Is it because of policy that requires involuntary commitment in order for somebody to be transported to a hospital? Is it because of fear from the provider community around lawsuits if somebody um, attempts suicide or there is harm done and so they automatically go to involuntary commitment? Is it the downfall or, or disintegration of community-based mental health systems that were never designed around recovery and are not accessible to people that do not have Medicaid funding? Uh, and even with people that do have Medicaid funding, the service array is not designed around recovery. There are so many reasons why we could be seeing such an increase in involuntary commitment in North Carolina. But unless that data is tracked is um, 
put out there for public cons consumption and is analyzed, it's difficult to know where to even start from an advocacy uh, stance. So that's why that bill had come about. Um, as you said, Lori, the data that we did gather is not even micro level data. We can't, for example, say how many of those were individual people that were involuntarily petitioned versus how many people were um, uh, just there for observation and released, how many of those um, were identified as non-binary, as male, as female, as some other variation. We can't track it by age group. We can't even track it by region because somebody might be petitioned in one county, but transported to another county. So there is a lot of flaws just relative to the data alone. Um, we had one of the biggest pushbacks of, around gathering the data. Uh, we have been told that it's too laborious, who should be responsible for it. It's too much for the police to be responsible for it. There are issues with um, the legal system being the one to uh, track the data. And there is issues with the MCOs and the hospitals being one, the ones to track the data. So it also became this sort of who, not it, not it, not it type of thing. <laughs> yeah. So let, let me just kind of stop there around that one bill to make sure that that provides some clarity about why that bill was even created and the challenges that we had in gathering the data. And, and Bob Ord wants to add something too, so that'll be great timing. Thank you. Yeah, if I can, thank you, everybody. And, and uh, thank you so much for this. I'm very excited that you all are holding this and moving forward. Um, you know, just somebody who works in this field, uh, it's very hard to, to witness what goes on in our system, particularly when it doesn't pay attention to itself. I did want to jump in uh, when, I, when uh, Shereen talked about the numbers, how it was collected, because we did start out getting the initial, this, the clerk's office information, but we actually, actually it was because of the intern hand, helping us uh, working with Shereen, uh, John, who was able to get to the administrative office of the courts and was able to actually go into some of the, 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 the raw data that they had there. The AOC does not produce any sort of master list or master report on uh, special proceedings. But anyway, he was able to pull out this information. There has been some controversy about this since it's been released, some denial of information, some saying it's not there. Uh, as far as we know, it is good, sound information. So if you hear some people question about what's going on, and I've heard of other reports where people saying, you know, that this is maybe not accurate, I will tell you, I have not heard from anyone else where they've been able to produce a report saying, no, we have this other information, this is more accurate, and this is why. These people do not have that information, which is why some, you know, a bill like this and the effort like this that you all are doing is very, very important. Thank you for clarifying that. And thank, thank you, Shireen, because uh, it's, you know, we're trying to, it's, it's so important for people to understand the drivers of things that have happened because it will help their advocacy. So I appreciate both of you guys adding that in. Any questions about that before I talk a little bit about the insight of the peer uh, of the, um, let's go to the non-police community response bill next. But is there any questions about the data bill, how it was developed, why it was written the way that it was written or any of the drivers? Yeah, Cameron, Cameron said it's the drug problem in our case. Uh, I'm assuming you mean contributing to such a large use of involuntary commitment. All right, so the second bill, when I'll I- I'll mute myself, I'm okay. sorry. Let me just say this. What I, ha I work in the uh, county jail. And what I have found is we have no resources for these people to go to. to, go to. There's nothing for mental health or drug rehab or whatever. I mean, I'm, the few people that I can get into rehab, I send off to Swain County or you know, some, other, some other, first at Blue Ridge or Black Mountain or whatever. There's nothing in Haywood County at all. Yeah. And whether you may have heard this or not, we're spending another 16 something million dollars to expand the jail and no money on mental health resources or drug recovery resources or whatever. $16 million. Wow. Going mm. to a new jail. To, and I mm -hmm. mean, everyone I deal with, I have at least 30, 30, about 30 girls, I only work with the women. I probably have 30 girls all the time and 99.9% .9 of them are drug, drug addicts and the other you know, percent are just, are mentally ill and on drugs. You know, I've got three girls right now that need some kind of behavioral health treatment. There's nothing. Yeah. 
nothing. So that's my speech. And if I could add, uh, the sheriffs, North Carolina Sheriffs Association just put out a report, uh, kind of a broad report, but they capture uh, in it a little information about the use of uh, law enforcement to do all the transporting and intervening where they feel like it needs to be done another way. And they have some recommendations, but they make that same case. Basically, the systems are so broken, there are no resources they have to link people with. They take people to the emergency departments knowing that a lot of those folks don't really meet the criteria to be in the hospitals, and it's just round and round we go. So that, I hear you, Cam. I, I, I hear a lot of these stories from different parts of the state. Bob, did you have another comment? Yes, uh, and also uh, hello to Haywood County. I used to work in Waynesville when I first started practicing. Um, and I, I, I will tell you the, uh, an important qualification of this, and it's an excellent question about, uh, about uh, the substance abuse issues. You know, North Carolina commitments are divided into two different camps with regards to commitments. You've got mental health commitment, a whole process dedicated to that, and then you've got another one, it's the substance abuse commitment. And we used to have way more substance abuse commitment here when our detox in Mecklenburg County was available. And there are in urban areas generally more resources. So places like Haywood County uh, do struggle immensely. Mo most of the rural counties do struggle immensely with, with getting those resources, be they mental health or addiction. But what I've seen over the past number of years is that uh, substance abuse treatment has virtually disappeared at a coercive level. And what's happened, I think, is that instead people are getting arrested or they're ending up in more tragic situations. Now you do have an overlap with people that are committed where they have a substance abuse problem as well. And I would say there's a significant number of my IBC mental health clients who do have that issue. Mm -hmm. And what's so sad is that there's not much integrated care for people who have substance abuse issues and mental health issues. Uh, right. Oddly, you do get substance abuse treatment in the substance abuse area. There tends to be much more overlap for taking care of people with mental health issues, but that is not the case if you are, have a mental illness and have an addiction issue. This is another reason why data is so important because we are not tracking what is happening. Well, and also, I, sir, oh. let me just also say that, um, uh, you know, addiction, particularly drug addiction is a mental health issue. Exactly. If you didn't have it before, you put enough junk in your system to screw up, you know, make it a mental health issue. Yeah. But I mean, they all have bipolar disease, you know, bipolar or, PTSD or, you know, all kinds of things. So it really is, like you said, it's, it's a combined issue. It's not just one or the other. And even in the urban areas, I, our peer center offers support to people coming out of the ED, uh, Baptist Hospital and Forsyth Hospital or Atrium and Novant um, contact us with folks coming out of the EDs that don't meet criteria for inpatient care. But if they don't contact us, these people hit the streets in three hours that they just turn them back out in the streets. But um, we we are able to do something that's not funded in our system. And this is why peer support is so important. We can receive them in a safe space for up to 24 hours, kind of let them get their feet under their knees emotionally, and then help look at what next steps we might be able to help them with. And so we have had people come in that we're able to actually get them in the detox. It wouldn't have happened if they hadn't come to us, you know. But all those little places where people fall through, peer networks are so important at the community level to help help respond to these. And then being associated with the peer center, we've had a lot of these folks and they may still be actively using that they become part of that peer community. And that is a support for them as they rethink choices about, do I really wanna consider recovery? So I'm, I'm just saying that there, there can be some solutions out there um, but yeah, right now things are so disjoint that that every all the other agencies are paying, you know, all the other agencies. So Shereen, you want to go to the next one? We had a question here for oh. you, Lori, in the chat. If you just want to, it says she's at the JR. Uh, what numbers of people in the center have you been able to do that? Uh, we we supported our 85th person yesterday, just yesterday. We've been doing this for about a year. Uh, what happens is every time there's a turnover of residents at the hospital, we have to kind of re-educate everybody because the ho within the hospital, like there's all the different layers of folks and they don't all communicate well with each other. So we're trying to kind of finesse how to be sure everybody knows this is here because we expected to have higher numbers. But we also have um, Novant 
sends people, they call us first, but they send an Uber, they, they send people over to us. All, you know, they'll send them to the peer center if they're not like an urgent crisis, but it's, it's, it's really a, a help. And I haven't counted how many of those I need to, and we need to do that. But so, yeah, we need these kind of settings across the state. Okay, go ahead. Shereen, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I, I really um, appreciate Cameron. It was, you actually have a good lead in. So your question is, what are the alternatives, right? So we keep building more jails, which we've learned for decades and decades that that's not the answer because people need more jails when there's no other options. So that's what led to the two other bills. The three of them were actually developed jointly, but they ended up being submitted independent of another because we didn't want um, one part of the bill to discourage the entire bill to be um, approved or to, to approve crossover. And so they were submitted separately, but developed together. So bill number one was the data bill. The second piece of that is alternatives to using police force. And this is when I was saying we went in with our ideal and had to concede. I went in very steadfast that we need completely non-police community response teams, that they were staffed by people with lived experience, perhaps with a social worker um, or another uh, clinician, maybe even a paramedicine, but it needed to be by community for community with community. Uh, and we had a design, that is the report that Gerard put out that had 16 recommendations of what a non-police community response looks like, including the values of it, the composition of the team, how they operate, their relationship with 911, um, and having a no wrong access to a non-police community response team. We went in very strong, that that's what we wanted. As you see, when you look at the bill, CIT is in there, expansion of CIT is in there, um, co-policing um, co responses are in there, um, including the paramedicine pilot that would not necessarily include a peer support specialist. Mobile crisis teams were in there. The reason we had to concede to expand it beyond non-police community response teams was because there are parts of the state that are so incredibly rural and they don't have some of the resources. You talked about Haywood County. They don't have some of the resources and there was a fear that there would be a strong resistance to a completely non-police community response that was piloted around the state. And so what we ended up doing in the, in the bill is actually tiering financial incentives for these different pilots. The largest amount of money would go to a completely non-police community response team. The second large, large amount of money would have gone to a co-responder team. The third would have been uh, CIT, right? So not ideal, not exactly mm -hmm. what we wanted from an advocacy perspective. I understand that I'm in an urban area and the urban area doesn't necessarily represent the entirety of North Carolina. And we have to start somewhere. Um, and I was not completely pleased that we had to expand it beyond uh, non-police community response team. But that's where that one landed. Obviously, there is a lot of attention being paid now to this issue, both on the racial inequity side, the injustice side around use of handcuffs and restraints for transport. Um, as well as the trauma and service side. Uh, but that was the second bill that was submitted uh, in, a, in the three bill package. So let me just pause there and see if that makes sense and any questions about that one. Thanks for those explanations. Um, you know, we know that a lot of things that America has been done in our country have been outmoded for some time. and. Unfortunately, in the deep south, <laughs> um, sometimes we have to take a, a stepwise, <clears throat> progress has to come in a stepwise way. And so some, some models that may not be nearly as, as uh, helpful as we think uh, may be included, but they're certainly better than a pure police response, which we, we've all gotten used to. Um, The third bill is the uh, next question is diversion to what? So this also gets to that question. Well, if we're not going to hospitalize people and we're not going to incarcerate them, what exactly are we diverting them to? 
Um, I will tell you, I was on the leave of absence when this bill was developed. I was not expecting that Promise Resource Network was, was going to be a named organization in this bill. We've had many conversations about that. Um, there are reasons why the legislators wanted to name Promise Resource Network in that particular bill. The, the bottom line for this one, though, is there needs to be alternatives. If we, are not, if we don't have anything to divert people to, then all of the conversation about non-policing, non-hospital, and non-incarceration becomes moot, frankly, yeah. because we don't have these alternatives. One of the things that we have found internationally is that peer-run organizations offer some of the best alternatives and the least restrictive approaches at the best outcomes with the least amount of money. As Lori talked about with her refuge program, um, that is an example of an alternative where people don't have to be hospitalized first, and we could even potentially divert from the, from the emergency department. Peer-run wellness centers are a natural way to create the prevention and the diversion end on the front end that is not based on Medicaid billing. It is not based on clinical diagnostics. It is zero force, zero coercion, completely about uh, healing and recovering together as a community. There are two pilots happening in North Carolina right now. The desire of the legislators was to build that more to scale and have four more added to the state of North Carolina as alternatives. The ultimate vision is to have things like peer run respites around the country, uh, but particularly around the state so that there is truly a diversion from the emergency department, hospital and police uh, involvement. So that was the third part of the one bill that was divided into threes. Any questions or comments or anything? It would be interesting, any of you guys who are involved in trying to develop some kind of peer operated um, little community setting or who, who have been thinking about it, uh, it'd be great if you could just write something in the comments section. So we kind of have an idea of who out there is trying to do this. I will tell you, in my community, uh, we happen to find a building we could use at no cost. It, it's a great space for what we're doing. And um, I, we operated with no funding at all for four years. So when I talk about bleeding edge, that's what I'm talking about. But I will say it has been so valuable. And, um, and some of you guys probably won't have to do that because we're being able to show outcomes and all that. And Shireen's group can certainly show outcomes. <laughs> but point is, um, yeah, this is a bleeding edge thing. But I'd love to see how many people out there are uh, who are thinking about this. Because, um, you know, we, our hope is that the legislature gives support to these changes. Oh, it looks like Mitchell has up his hand, hand, her, her hand up, Mitchell. Did you want to say something? Ask a question. Hi, yes, I'm from Sparta, North Carolina, which is uh, very remote in my opinion because we're a small county where there hasn't really been resources in this area. I'm, I'm going almost 49 years old and uh, April this year, I have, will have five years clean from opiates, but I became addicted to those opiates due to an injury. Um, so I was prescribed on the medical scene by the medical field. So I thought when it came to a solution, the solution to that problem would had to be on the medical scene. And I didn't understand the law enforcement involvement, the DA, the, you know, social services and involuntary commitments and being sent to, uh, mental health services for a problem that I thought was medically a solution for. And uh, having had sit down with a, uh, a doctor who explained to me because uh, drugs are successfully given and successfully taken away on the medical scene by uh, a, what are they called? Um, can't think of the, the doctor's name that does that, but 
it's all about language for me, I guess. I'm not a peer support specialist. I've been like I was in, in, in recovery at 19 and through all the resources and funding and everything going into a system that doesn't provide a medical solution. In four hours time, I traveled out of the country and in four hours time had my uh, endorphins and receptors balanced to equilibrium to where um, cravings were uh, not a problem. If you have a, a baby born that is in withdrawal syndrome, like you don't send a, a police officer in there to uh, address the problem with the baby that's in withdrawal syndrome. You don't send DHS in there to uh, how did that how are they going to reverse that withdrawal syndrome? How's a social worker going to reverse that? Well, I, thank you so much for your comments. Um, you know, you just kind of make the case for where our need, need is at this point. Um, I am having, I'm going to have to drop, I think I'm going to have to drop off and come back on because for some reason uh, I'm being told that I have low resources and I, I've closed all the other apps except for this one. So y'all bear with me if I do that um, so I can see the slides again, okay? Let me try one more time. Well, thank you. Uh, that's very heartfelt, Michelle. And uh, yeah, I don't know if we anyone has a thought for that, for uh, about that, about how to address that. But uh, I think one thing we're saying is there's not always a clinical medical solution for everything. There's a lot of uh, need to uh, work with someone for your self-care and self-help. And I think if for uh, for me personally, when an anesthesiologist, okay, uh, if you have an anesthesiologist, a trauma nurse, and uh, basically in four hours time, it's like going to the dentist. Like you can go home the, the same day. You don't have to suffer tormenting 94 day. Uh, you know, I did that for years, uh, suffering and, and great suffering, trying to relieve myself of something that was uh and done in four hours time. Was this outside but, of the country? Did you say it was out of the country that you did Yes, ma'am, because over here, like I, I was subject to arrest and other things where in other countries, they don't look at it the way that we do over here. They think about it differently. And so there is other approaches. Like if you had a, a, a anesthesiologist and a trauma nurse set up in any facility, one room, you could, you could tr uh, treat 20 people in a day by turning them out every four hours. Well, that sounds fascinating. I think it's something we need to talk more about and explore. I'd love to talk to you more what, about it. Can I ask you what country that was that you were in? Israel, where oh. they're, ten, they're light years ahead of the curve uh, compared to us. Awesome. Well, uh, I think, did you want to put your email in the chat and maybe we can uh, someone get back to you so we can sure, thank you. discuss that more because uh, that is fascinating. A lot of time we talk about the clinical as being very limited, but maybe on the other side of it, if all the partners are working harm harmoniously together, that can work totally different. So that's a very important perspective and we appreciate that. I think Virgil has a uh, comment. Virgil? And after, after his comment, we'll probably need to get back to the slides since we're- yeah, We're gonna probably finish up with the slides, but why don't we let the, uh, Virgil- Go ahead. Uh, you need to unmute. Yeah, good morning everybody. Um, great, great seminar. Uh, we're forming a You Empower You. It's a nonprofit in Onslow County. We are currently North Carolina certified peer support specialists. We're involving the local politicians, town councils, uh, county commissioners, and the faith based community in an initiative to start this type of peer support based center. Um, outside of the Medicaid community, which we currently uh, primarily deal with, our problem we're running into is getting funding to uh, start the program down here in terms of instead of uh, law enforcement being involved, we deal in crisis management now with the yeah. client that we work with. So we are involved with it at the community level, but again, our issue is we're trying to get all levels 
coordinated on the same page to make this happen. Um, the Promise Resource Network, should I be contacting you guys to get involved with you to help establish that in Oslo County? But there is no facility for treatment centers, but only in the crisis mode. But I would recommend there's a Facebook page for a coalition about peer operated settings called uh, Peer Wellness Center. Isn't that what's called, Shereen? <laughs> peer Wellness Center Coalition. Yes. That might be a good go to for place to start, a good, good, good place to start the conversation. And some of us who are already doing it can interact with and help offer some support for you guys who are thinking about it. So we have an established group. It's a Facebook page and it, it's probably gonna get a whole lot more active <laughs> now. But. I, I appreciate that, thank you. And if, if you'll put your email in the comment section, then we can, I'll send you a link. Okay, thank you. I will You're welcome, do that. Richard, thanks. Thank you everyone, uh, good questions. And I think we're gonna go back to the lecture format now. So we'll go to a screen share and be sure you're, uh, yeah, I've ha uh, sure you're muted. So I'm gonna go back to the uh, screen share and we'll finish the lecture portion of the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Do I lecture people? <laughs> anyway, oh, um, we just call it lecture. That's yeah, it. no, that's fine. No, that's fine. I'll just laugh. Uh, next slide, please. Then, so that was just kind of an overview about what these bi three bills encompass and kind of where they came from. And I, I certainly appreciate Shireen's and Bob Ward's input to help uh, give you guys more background. So people are wanting to know about action steps. And I'm realizing there are a couple of things from what uh, Representative Autry said that I probably should have written down, but, but the, if we'll go to the next slide, we'll at least make a start. So the things we can do are contacting key legislator, legislators, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, but also especially contacting people from your district. Um, if, if you go to the uh, General Assembly website, which is simply, um, I think it's just www.n, I think it's ncga.gov, I'm sorry, that's in our uh, other slide, but if you just Google North Carolina General Assembly, it'll take you to their website. And um, you can, if you just kind of play around, you'll see there's a place that drops down um, the, the, the Senate and the House and all the people who represent folks and what um, districts they represent. And I think there may be a search thing where you can put in your county and it'll uh, pop up the ones who represent you. But um, you can find out who they are because I bet you a lot of people don't know who their representatives are because you are really, really busy in the trenches and you got to get your heads out of the trenches to do this stuff some. And um, I know what that's like. But um, so find out who your local folks are. I'll, uh, there are people, if they're not too high up with a whole lot of responsibilities in the legislature, we have at times been able to call and meet them for coffee on Fridays. They're almost always home on Fridays. And so um, that's a good way to start a relationship and let them know what your concerns are, your interests are. And um, that if you call their offices, likely their staff are gonna answer, but if they're there, the staff will hand the phone off to them usually. If not, the staff are just as important as anybody for taking messages. The staff, my experience has been the staff can come to understand the overall, they get that global picture faster than the legislators because the legislators themselves are having to work on so many different things. So the legislative assistants are very, very important. And so, um, so reach out to your local elected officials. And then as far as um, the other key legislators I was talking about, the three important committees for what we're talking about now with these three bills are the House Health Committee. And when you go to the legislative website, there's a tab for committees and it'll drop down House Committees. And, um, and you can click on that committee and it'll, it'll open up and show you who the chairs are. And you can pick, click on any one of those chairs and it will give you the contact information. We will supply to everybody that registered We'll get an email out to you guys. 
that will have um, a list of these folks on it and their contact information, okay? Um, and I'll try to do that by Monday. <laughs> anyway, so there's the House, House Health Committee, and this is real important, the Joint Legislative Oversight Committee on Health and Human Services, because um, they kind of what comes out of the House Committee will go to them um, for one thing. And then also the House Appropriations Committee, um, because they're the ones who decide what is gonna be funded in the health and human services arena. So uh, Representative Autry was talking about that too. House Appropriations is really, really important for, for these bills. And um, the interesting thing that makes life a little easier is most of the people, it's like a lot of these people are on two or all three of these committees. So it's not as, it's not, don't, it's not like every committee means a whole big batch of new folks. There's a lot of overlap. But these three committees, because of where things are with the bill right now, are the ones that are most important for us to address information to, and then, and, and especially our local uh, legislators, because your local legislator is also likely, may well even be experiencing in his own family some similar things, but if not, they see how broken everything is. It's like what what Representative Lambus said to Representative Autry about, you know, when he was reading the bills is, this system is broken. So they're wanting solutions. They wanna hear from their people. They wanna be responsive to their people. So, uh, you know, if you're a constituent of a certain person, call that gentleman or that lady and let them know your concerns and what you're hoping will happen. Um, and so, like I said, we will send information to you guys after this. Um, next slide. So I talked about, you know, contacting by telephone, even if they're not available. Um, the assistants are really good to take message and really capture the content, especially if you can be pretty focused with your information. So, you know, uh, like Representative Autry was talking about the 30 second thing. Uh, it can be more than 30 seconds, but I always write down the key thing I wanna be sure they hear first. And then I try to write down three little bullet points of what I might say to kind of qualify what the point I'm trying to make. Um, sometimes there, there's an appropriate place to tell your story, but this is probably not the most appropriate place to tell your story in a phone call because they don't have the time and the attention span for it. So get to the meat and the meat first. There are other places where your story will really matter. Um, and of course, writing by email or written letter. Now this is a place where you can tell your story more effectively. I, um, I, to, I wrote to two legislators about one of the factors in our son's um, suicide was that he didn't have health care. And I wrote a letter and just briefly told how that was a factor, what he was experiencing health-wise when he made that decision to exit. And I had responses within the hour from two of the co-chairs of that committee. And so it's, it's really important if you can be succinct in, in, telling your, in justifying with your personal experience. And that's different from telling your whole story, you know justify from your personal experience briefly in writing, then that goes a long way. And you can do it by email, um, for, but you know what? An old fashioned letter these days will capture someone's attention better than an email. And so don't, don't neglect that if you're a letter writer. Next, next slide. Okay, before we get to messaging, does that, does that sound helpful to people? Are there any questions about kind of contacting their elected officials. Okay. Then, um, and, and we'll also send just kind of like a little sample letter if that's helpful. So th those are the two things we'll try to send you guys. Now, here's where um, Shireen, uh, other people may want to uh, add some comment, but I feel like there's some key issues that, that we need to try to, as a group to get our heads around so that we can really advocate well on these issues. And um, it's one of those things where some of us have been doing this for years, have kind of connected the same dots long enough. We see certain trends. And so we, we, we realize there's good language for things, but um, we, you know, just to, to some points, involuntary treatment or involuntary evaluation 
in an emergency department is often inappropriately utilized. Bob Ward can speak to this very well. A lot of, and the sheriff's report speaks to this. A lot of times law enforcement is called in not necessarily because somebody is looking so urgently like uh, they would meet criteria for court, um, you know, for commitment, but because family members, other people on the committee, they don't know how to get someone to the ED. And so they call law enforcement or they take out, an order gets taken out to, for the law enforcement to pick them up and transport them. Our police officers and sheriff's deputies are doing so much of this. And their departments are now smaller than you. We've had a lot of people exit police work. So this is really becoming an intensifying problem for law enforcement. They're becoming transporters of people that they themselves know don't meet the criteria for commitment. Um, and so we need to help our legislators understand that we're aware that that's a problem. Um, second thing, forced treatment has consequences to individuals and their families. Uh, lots of stories of, of how this has disrupted family relationships. You talk about othering somebody, we'll, we'll slap an order on them, you know? Hospitalization, excuse me, hospitalization is not always helpful. There are alternative ways of responding to a person in crisis that helps put people on a path to mental health recovery. And, and, and then like I shared earlier, um, according to the National Institutes of Health, um, there, after a review of, sev of several studies, it's found that the highest, um, the highest risk of someone taking his or her own life is within those first few weeks after a psychiatric hospitalization. So I'm not saying it's the hospitalization that triggers that necessarily, but it certainly shows us hospitalization is not the silver bullet that America has for so long considered it to be. Next slide. Or we do oh, oh, Wanda, yeah, go ahead, Ms. Bell. So speaking on it with law enforcement um, dealing with clients, or uh, I'm a veteran, and here recently in Winston-Salem, there was a person that was from my area that was um, taken to Winston-Salem and it wasn't voluntarily. So they just slept this on him and they took him down there. So what ended up happening is he walked out of the hospital and wasn't seen. They just had his friend on this past Saturday. And I'm concerned because what protocols was put in place keep from him walking out or getting in contact with his family members. I think they need to be more aware of um, having a point of contact for these people that they take from one area to another um, to make sure that they get back home safely to their family members, especially when they're dealing with mental health issues. Yeah, yeah we see a lot of this. Um, so to her point, actually, they couldn't have walked out uh, if they were committed, if there was an order taken out and they were taken by law enforcement, the law enforcement officers have to stay with them until they are either released or they are um, hospitalized. So if they're deemed as not needing hospitalization, law enforcement, if they know the people and they know where they live, sometimes the officers are still there and they'll, they'll take them. But they get a nod from the doctors, you know, before too long, whether or not they're committable. And uh, if they're not committable and the officers and there are calls from other parts of town, they have to go. And so um, I mean, this has been my experience. So, so um, he probably was evaluated and, and, and they deemed him not needing commitment. And this is where it would have been nice if they could have called Green Tree uh, us because this is a lot of the kind of folks that we end up uh, engaging and, and they usually wanna come, <laughs> uh, have, you know, be in a safe space with supportive folks for a little while while we can help them, you know, next steps. But yeah, that's a, that's a real big problem. Any other comments about that? Lori, um, this is Nancy. Uh -huh. uh, I would just like, like to ask something. What happens when you're forced, when you, you go in voluntarily and then you're forced because there's no beds, you get transported somewhere where you have, you, you're kept and you get transported somewhere where you refuse, you, you told them you didn't want to go um, and you're forced to go there and the, the care is so bad um, it, cause it happened to me personally, the care was so bad that, um, 
that's where I, um, that's where I attempted uh, to take my life at the hospital to the point of defibrillation. And then I was released two hours later. Yeah. Um, uh, I was released two hours later and they didn't even ask me if I was still suicidal. The care was so bad at that mental hospital. So So what what are we going to do, you know, when the care is so bad at the mental hospital that I was forced to go, that I was forced to go to, I had no, that I I had no, I was IVC, I had no choice to go, but I had to go there. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for being transparent. That's hard stuff to, to make public on a, with a group of people, most of whom you have never met, but, um, I actually get calls outside of all the other peer stuff that I'm doing. I get calls from all over the state from family members with stories just like this. A, a loved one opted to go to the hospital and because of various reasons, they get sent to another hospital and they don't want to stay in that hospital. So that hospital, I mean, th- this, this happens. I don't know how many of you peers have heard these kinds of stories, but this stuff is happening <laughs> And, they did um, not contact my emergency con- They did not contact my doctor. They did not contact my emergency contact. They did not, and they just discharged me within two hours after defibrillating the, me. After defibrillating me. And how telling is that? I mean, yeah. Anyway, yeah. well, I, I, I don't know. If I, my blood pressure is going up, but <laughs> um, the thing is that right now we don't have any. There's nothing we can do about that, and. You know, I try to urge families and the individual themselves to calmly write out in good, clear language um, what they're experiencing and why they want to leave. And I have the families make a copy of that letter for the record that they've sent and they and then be, and get that letter to the clinicians working with them. But um, I have because, no fa- I have no biological. Yeah, I mean, family. if you don't or even as an individual, um, you you can write that letter and ask them to put it in your record. And I would have somebody. But I have, I, it's, I have, a, I have a advanced directive and yeah. that did no good. Well, that, uh, there's, that's another whole webinar. Do we really <laughs> have advanced? We, North Carolina no. statute does not provide no. for advanced directives. They provide no. for advanced instruction where you get to share mm-hmm. what you desire, but there's, there's no teeth to it. But that's another mm-hmm. thing. But mm-hmm. it's a very important thing. So maybe we'll talk. That's a, an advocacy issue to come. So send me your email address. <laughs> Put it in the uh, chat. Thank anyway, you. Any other comments on, on that? that little, there's another little set of uh, principles I wanted to talk about. But um, and if Shireen's still on, if she wants to throw anything in just because she's uh, used to thinking on her feet about things like this, but if not, no, we'll I mean, you, you, you definitely shared some of the issues. I think it's really important for people to understand and look into the data about post involuntary commitment, suicide attempts and suicide completions. We know that there is a hundred percent increase of attempts of suicide post release within four days of an involuntary commitment. Um, the other thing I would add is there is a narrative that has been created that jail is bad and hospital is good. And one of the things that we continue to say is that confinement is bad. Confinement is harmful. It's, and when you add on forced confinement in the name of treatment, we call it trauma in the name of treatment. And so we have got to reclaim this narrative. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that the, the person that just spoke up to share your experiences, because unfortunately, many of your, your experience is not an unusual one. No. This is part of the reason why Bob is so passionate about this. How many people voluntarily went to a hospital and was involuntarily transitioned to involuntary without their knowledge just to transport them and then turned around with thousands of dollars of a bill from the hospital for their involuntary treatment. There's so many issues with, with the way involuntary commitment is done, but fundamentally it starts with this belief that confinement is helpful. And the answer and the truth is that it is not Are there exceptional situations? Of course, there are exceptional situations, but those should be the exceptions. And unfortunately, we're using hospitalization and involuntary treatment as the treatment of choice in North Carolina. And that has got to change if we are gonna impact anything from the quality to the incarceration issues, to the policing issues, to the ED boarding issues. 
to the policies that require involuntary commitment, to the lack of due process that people face when they are involuntarily committed. It is a very complex issue. And unless those of us who've experienced these things personally or have a passion for this step into using our voice, mm -hmm. it is not getting better. It's getting worse in our state. Yeah. Yeah. Lori, uh, did you want to continue with the slides? We're almost at one o'clock. So. Okay, yeah, next slide then. Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go. Okay, uh, yeah, next, yeah, next slide. All right, this is an important thing. The word accountability, especially in a climate where we have maintained a majority of people who are Republicans, they're all, they're real big about being sure their dollars, you know, that not misusing dollars, right? So um, we seek accountability for how public dollars are utilized. And even people with mental health challenges deserve accountability. Public dollars should purchase services and supports that help people recover their mental health. Medications alone do not do this. See, these are the things the legislators have no idea about, but I have, I've written to different legislators about this and they're, you know, one of them said this, thank you so much for helping me understand this. I am putting it in my toolbox. Um, they need to hear from us that medications alone don't help us recover and sometimes they hurt. Um, mental ill being is not just a biological thing. The trauma and social isolation are proven factors and there are approaches like peer support. And then I get to the next bullet. We need alternative approaches. So y'all all say that with me. We need alternative approaches. Scream it. We need alternatives. Yes. Desperately. Like peer support, uh, psychosocial rehabilitation. Those are fancy words, but basically it's just recovery focused treatments that are much more oriented around social connection and, and, and other things. And peer operated setting, settings that reduce and effectively respond to crisis. And we become the backdrop for the other, the other crisis system out there that can, you know, we're that, we can be that fabric of support under a really uh, poorly woven safety net. So those are real important, y'all. Public accountability. Are our dollars purchasing good results in people's lives? No, they're not. And I'll never forget, probably about 15 years ago, going and having a coffee with a friend of mine who said, Laurie, the reason there's no accountability to us is because we don't matter. And that struck me so profoundly. And it made sense of why all those years when I was the only person that I knew of going and trying to talk to legislators about this stuff, it's so easy to dismiss us, or the HHS, it's so easy to dismiss us. Y'all, it doesn't have to be easy for us to be dismissed. If we pull together, unite around some common themes and language and start reaching out to decision makers, um, we can tip the scale. And this is an excellent opportunity with these three um, bills. So next, next slide. Uh, law enforcement officers should not be first responders um, if there's not a criminal violation happening or when no one's threat, threat is, safety is being threatened, excuse me. Um, research indicates that, yeah, this is important, y'all. You know, we are the dangerous people, right? And yet research indicates only three to 5% of violent acts are attributed to people with severe mental illness. The number does go up when you consider people who are in, who are actively influenced by something they've been using and addiction. So the number, this is specific to the, the mental people with, who've only been identified with the mental health thing. But the point is uh, the mental illness is not the thing that makes people dangerous. So we need to help people realize, kind of demystify with our stories and our relationships at the community level, what this thing is that we, we live with. You know, I have a mental health challenge but I'm learning to get beside it so it does not control my life. And that's what, that's what we can all do, you know? And um, people need to understand that it, it's, uh, what people don't understand, they tend to fear. So if we can make this all more relatable through our relationships and our communities and keep working on that, um, 
we need to decrease this fear factor that's driving so much. It's, it's fear and convenience to certain other folks that seems to drive this, but another bullet, law enforcement is often utilized to transport nonviolent people. And I uh, referenced North Carolina Sheriff's Association report that just came out in January, but um, they state in that report, there are no resources for us to take folks to. This is not, you know, if, other things aren't working. So the jails are becoming the de facto inpatient settings. And we're doing a whole lot of transporting to people that we know are going to be released three hours later to the streets with no support. So uh, it's like all these people are, are seeing the same thing. But we need to capture that kind of messaging so that legislators are hearing it, not only from the law enforcement agencies, but from us, you know. So, Nick, oh, uh, Bob, I want to see Bob's comment. Sorry. I closed my comments. Bob, did you want to make a quick comment? Sure. I, I mean, I, did, I, I just can't emphasize this enough. There will always be people that are not for this, that uh, like John, you know, mentioned, there are people who don't believe this is, is necessary, probably because they've been hurt by people along the way, and they've got their own mental health forgiveness issues. We can't fix all of that. In criminal justice reform, and I, I, I did a lot of work at, with this in the late 80s and the early 90s, or and into the 90s. Um, there, there was a lot of pushback on on you know uh, doing really good reform, and people like me and, and you all are people that, that we want to do the right thing. You want to do what works. It just makes so much sense. There was the other group that was against it, but the, the real tiebreaker on this was the costs. And I think, and I I found out that the best way to sort of sell to sell these things was not to necessarily rely on one, but all three, tell all the, because you don't know who you're talking to. Yeah. But all three, you can say, and, and, and the one knee jerk for everybody, the one selling point is public safety. You get better public safety with the proposals that you all have. Exactly. You get better cost savings and you save and improve lives. And I promise you the people that are kind of antagonistic, they tend to think of themselves as people who want to save and improve lives, even if they're not, but you want to make sure that you basically you're kind of saying this is better public safety. The police believe this. The sheriff's department believe this. They just don't know how to kind of they, they don't have anything to kind of get behind because we don't have the data until now or the 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 um, the political data. And I'll, lastly, I'll say this: when I was doing this reform work, I was told by somebody who's very very um, savvy, much success in in the political world. Uh, he was they were they were they were helping us. Uh, actually, it was Justice Fellowship, what it was. We were doing reform on, set, on structured sentencing, and it was Chuck Colson. And Chuck Colson sat there in the room, about 12, much smaller room than you guys have, and about 12 of us who were working on this stuff. And we were all happy because we had this great report with all this great stuff. And he said, look, folks, in the end, all politics comes down to one word. And that one word is capital. There are only two kinds of capital. One is financial, and the other is political. What you all are working on right now and what Lori and Shereen and others are trying to urge you to do is, is, you know, come to bat with your political capital and to create this political capital. And the message is there and you can kind of keep it simple. But the more people that you get involved, you know, that, 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 that show up to this 50 or so that are persistent at it, others from around the state, the right kind of people, it will happen in time. It may not happen this year, but it will happen. Gosh, thank you so much for all that. Political capital, folks. And also the comment about, you know, uh, this is a public safety issue and we're buying more sub public safety at lower cost by responding with alternatives. So thanks for all that. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, next slide. Um, the only little thing I wanted to add, and I've already mentioned it, um, I've been urged to probably reach out to the chairs of, um, committee first to be sure they're aware, but if we think we want to uh, speak, we, we want to be sure that they include language as far as data keeping that looks at um, demographics, we, we're going to need to add that language in. And so um, we'll, we'll start, I think that's something real important for us as peers because this gets at the, dis the disparities socially and, and, and you know, all the, the disparities in how things are dealt with. If we don't keep this kind of data, it's not going to help us that much. So we need to be sure that we do that. So we'll we'll advocate for them to include language that uh, addresses health disparity by capturing demographic data. So if not us, then if not now, then when? And if not us, then who? 
Y'all, I don't know how many people actually signed in to this meeting, but you know, we are the political capital, but we've got to we've got to activate. And At so number, Lori, we had 52. I counted okay. 52 at the top. Cool. And so um, if 52 people from across the state start reaching out to their legislators and there's just a bubbling up of some of the same thinking coming across the state to, to legislators in their home offices and um, you know, in Raleigh, it's gonna make a difference. And, and y'all, we're, we're the only ones that can, we're the ones with the message, but we also, um, we're not the old voices that the legislators are, have quite frankly kind of come to start shutting out. So we really, really need to work and work together. Thank you so much for learning with us. And we thank you for advocating with us and we will send out some information that may be helpful to you, um, um, hopefully by Monday. So well, you're muted. We take a quick look in the chat and see if there are any final yeah, is there a way to save the chat so we can get uh, people's emails? I, I'll uh, try to save the chat. I'm going to save the video recording. And uh, and these will be posted on the Peer Voice, uh, the Peer Advocacy uh, Coalition Facebook page. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I guess we're going to sign off for now. And we'll, you'll be hearing back from us soon. And we'll continue the charge. Of keep the working and keep the faith. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.